Now we can say the same thing over and over. And finally, at one little moment, people grasp it. They understand it. So I can tell you night after night that all things exist in the human imagination. And I can tell you that man is all imagination and God is man and exist in us and we in him. That the eternal body of man is the imagination and that is God himself. That is the divine body we call Jesus Christ in scripture. And because of previous training, we may question that or hesitate to, well, take it seriously. Tonight, I hope I can show you through stories how true this is. You may never really lose yourself to the extent that I wish you would, but nevertheless, I'll tell you. Last Saturday, a friend of mine in from New York, she came in during the week and she was here on Friday. And I invited her to dinner on Saturday with a few other friends of hers out here. She called you on the day and asked if she could come early. Could she come at four instead of five when I invited them? That she had things to tell me and they would not understand it and she would feel ill at ease in the presence of others in discussing these things. Now let me go back a little while with this lady. I met her here in this city 20 odd years ago. She was a beautiful young woman, about 30, a model. She had bought a little home for her parents and she was paying off the mortgage. And she said to me then, this is now 20 odd years ago, I've always dreamed of going to Paris and I really don't have the money. I have enough in the bank to go tourist and leave for just one week in a modest way. Go to some small little hotel or maybe some little rooming place and only for a week. I couldn't afford beyond that. And even that seems stupid now, but I think that I'm still paying off on the house. I said, you're asking the wrong person for advice because I'm not a rational person when it comes to the world. To me, I do not go along with the reasoning mind. I am talking of an entirely different principle. I am speaking of imagination and imagination to me is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ to me is God. And there is nothing but God, and all things are possible to God. So if you want me to give you a reason for going or not going, do not ask me. You want to go, and you have just enough for a quick one. One week in Paris, maximum. Go tourist and live modestly and come back. Well, she didn't tell me what she would do, but she did go. On the second day in Paris, on a blind date, she met a man, 23 years her senior. He was already married five times. There was no offspring, but they fell in love. He divorced his fifth, married her, and they were blessed with a child, the image of that man. When I saw pictures of him, he was born in Russia, when I saw pictures of him, it could have been pictures of his little boy. Through the years, well, the man is very wealthy. She came into a fortune. International business. Factories here in our country, factories in Paris, factories in Puerto Rico, and factories all over. A very, very wealthy man. <clears throat> He went wild over this offspring. Well, as a boy grew, he was then two and a half years old. And one night I had a vision. 
and I saw a little boy. He was about five years old, handsome beyond measure. And he told me that I was his father. I said, well, if I'm your father, then when are you going to come on earth and be my son? So I am your father. Are you coming down to earth and be my son? He said, yes. I said, when? He said, on the 10th of November. I said, you are? Now, this is late September. So I said to my wife the next morning, I said, darling, you know, you're going to have a baby on the 10th of November. <clears throat> and she said, I really believe all that you teach, but after all, this is ridiculous. I'm not even pregnant. This is late September. I'm going to have a son on the 10th of November? <clears throat> she said, no, that is out. I said, all right, that's what he told me anyway. That night in New York City at my lecture, this lady appeared. Her little boy was two and a half, and she was way out in hell. She looked as though she could have it right then. So I said to her, when do you expect your son? She said, no son, I'm going to have a daughter. <clears throat> Joseph and I, we want a daughter. Don't want any son, we have our son. I said, but when do you expect your child then? She said, oh, the doctor said around early January. I said, should your son be born on the 10th of November, may I tell you his name? <clears throat> his name is Neville Mark, <clears throat> because that's what he told me. <clears throat> well, on the 10th of November, she had her little boy. And she called him Neville Mark. <clears throat> well, the family now of four, the two boys, and they grew. <clears throat> when the first one, the image of his father, Larry, reached the age of 18, they sent him off to college in England. <clears throat> Pardon me. And one morning, on a Saturday morning, I got a call from her. And she said, Larry is dead. Didn't prepare me at all. Was Larry is dead. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I've just got a call from the headmaster of the college in London. Larry was killed today. Suddenly, in this automobile accident, one of five, but he was the only one killed. The other survived. He wasn't driving the car. He was in the car. And we were leaving within an hour. Joseph... And Neville and myself were leaving in the hour to go to London. So they did, <clears throat> and brought back the ashes of Larry and scattered it in Central Park. She went into shock, completely shocked. And for two months, she wasn't here. Her husband called me long distance. He wrote me, to said, what to do? I do not know what to do. Should I put her into some asylum? Should I bring in something? Because she is not here. <clears throat> she refuses to be part of this world. But you do not know this woman. She has a determination that is like steel. You can't divert her. She can take any goal in this world and realize it. <clears throat> and she had one goal now. She had to know about Larry. If what I'm teaching is true, <clears throat> that all things exist in the human imagination, then Larry existed in her imagination. <clears throat> and she had <clears throat> to see him and touch him and know him and know that he survived. She said, my religion failed me. My philosophies failed me. I couldn't open a book. Nothing could in any way encourage me or support me. <clears throat> and I lived in this state just completely in shock to the despair of my family. And on this morning, two months later, I felt something surging within me, surging and surging. And then out of my own being, here comes Larry. He is seated on the side of this chair in my bedroom. It's my bedroom. He lived on the 33rd floor on Central Park South. Here is Larry. And then I said, Larry, there? Well, I can put myself there too. And she did. She said, I sat right next to him and felt him. Then I brought Neville. And he sat next to me. 
And here the three of us, I've never seen Larry so beautiful. His face was just like velvet. You've never seen such beauty of skin as Larry. And we communicated without the use of words. And he said to me, Mother, I didn't want to hurt you. And here he's talking to me without any use of words, but he's telling me, and I'm listening, that I said to Neville, Neville, go and get Daddy. Daddy was then in the living room. This is the early hours of the morning, about six. Go and get Daddy and tell Daddy to come. And the minute he got up and started towards the living room to bring his father, something happened in her and something broke. And then the whole thing faded. But she said, at that moment, I was completely cured. I had a pain that no doctor could help. No philosopher could help. No religious person could help. No book could help. Here I am in a pain. A pain that no one could understand. It was a physical pain. My body was racked with it. And at that moment, I was completely relieved of all sense of loss and all sense of pain. And I proved that all things do exist in my own wonderful human imagination. And that's where Larry was. I brought him out as an objective being seemingly independent of my perception of him. And he sat on the side of that chair, on the arm of the chair, that big chair in my bedroom, and Neville sat on the other arm. I sent Neville to call Daddy, and then I went in. <clears throat> After it broke, I then got off the bed. And I went into the living room, and here was Joseph reading the paper. And I told him what had just happened. And do you know, he was just like a shadow. A shadow that talked. I looked at my husband, and here is only a shadow. A talking shadow. That day I had to go out. And I went down the street shopping. And everyone was but a shadow. Talking shadows. The whole vast world was but a shadow. And so when we say, all that you behold, though it appears without, it is within, in your own wonderful human imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. Everything here seems so real. Cut it and it breathes. It is only a shadow. And she was cured instantly. When she, out of her own being, conjured her son and made him sit on the arm of the chair. And she herself brought her own being out of it and sat in the center on that chair. And then brought Neville, who was sung to sleep in his own room, and then said to him, go and get Daddy. Let him come and see how beautiful Larry is, skin like velvet, so altogether lovely. She never saw him so beautiful. And he said to her, Mother, I never wanted to hurt you. I didn't want to hurt you. And so, and the whole thing faded, and she realized that what I told her before, that all things exist in the human imagination, was true. We are living in a shadow world. The immortal man is your own wonderful human imagination. That man can never die. That's Jesus Christ. <clears throat> you are the Lord Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is not some intangible thing. You speak of imagination. It's defined in the script, in the uh, dictionary, as the picture forming faculty of the mind. It's defined as that which can conjure and create an idea or an image independent of objective reality. <clears throat> they call this the reality independent of objective reality. And what it conjures, they call it the unreal. That a simple apprehension of objective facts, objective objects in these world, they call that sense perception and therefore reality. If it isn't present, that's unreal and therefore imagination. This is now considered real. And I think of the home that I left an hour ago, the home to which I hope to return tonight within an hour. 
That, because it's not present to my senses, that's unreal. That's imagination. This, that I do not know as well, this is real, because it's present to my senses. And I am telling you, it's just the reverse. The whole vast world exists within the human imagination. And if you are as intense as that woman, I have never met anyone more intense than that woman. She said to me, we got notice we had to vacate our business, that is the building, on 57th Street between Fifth Avenue and Madison. A most expensive neighborhood where you pay fifty, sixty, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 for an area not as big as this a year in rent. Certainly not as big as this room. <clears throat> One floor. He is a couturier. He has his factories in London and uh, Paris, factories in New York, factories in Puerto Rico. <clears throat> and here an area not as big as this. It's long and narrow and could not, if I took the square measure of this room, it could not, that place could not be this big. And he was paying sixty-five, seventy thousand dollars $70,000 a year rental. In his own place for a living, he paid $1,250 a month for that 33rd floor apartment that he had. That's a lot of money, plus running businesses and paying a payroll to maybe 150 or 200 people every week. That runs into a fortune. He received notice that they're going to terminate his lease because the IBM, the International Business Machine, bought the building to demolish it and build a huge, big building for themselves. Headquarters in New York City. He had to get out. He began to give her all kinds of reasons why he couldn't find a place. She said, don't tell me what you don't want. Don't tell me what can't be done. Tell me what you want. You name them. I don't care how many you name, you just simply name them. We said, I want a building on 57th Street between 5th Avenue and 6th Avenue. And they say there is no building for sale, not even for rent, but certainly not for sale. You don't tell me what is not, tell me what you want. Now, he said, we have 18 months to go on our present apartment. It's $1,250 a month. I would like to move and reduce our rent. All right. But who is going to pay $1,250 and take over my lease? Don't tell me who is going to do it. Tell me what you want. Well, that's what I want. I want to get out of that lease and find a place just as nice, as tall as that. They were on the 33rd floor, up to the 30s, where I can have a view and not pay that sort of money. He gave her 12 things. She has the capacity to go into these states and bring them out, and they are objective to her. Every one, he found the place, number 41 West 57th Street, Eight-story building. It wasn't for sale. He didn't, she didn't concern herself with what is or is not for sale. She got it. They are there now. Someone came in after she released the apartment in her mind's eye and actually moved into another one right next door to this on 57th Street. Someone came in and said, I'll take over your lease at the same rent, 1250 and then she found the place on the 30th floor, right adjacent to where they own now the eight-story bu uh, eight building, for $650 a month, reducing it by $600. Everything that he requested, she did it. <clears throat> That's her intensity. And she was determined to, now, to know what happened to Larry. She wanted to prove to her own satisfaction that Larry survived. Larry is real. It's not just a dream that her Larry is a solid reality. And she could put her hand on Larry and talk to Larry and communicate with Larry. And the whole thing became a reality to her. That is Louise. She has proven beyond all doubt the truth of what I'm trying to tell everyone that I meet that imagining creates reality because imagining is God in action. <clears throat> that the human imagination is Jesus Christ and there is no other Jesus Christ. 
That is the Lord Jesus Christ of Scripture. So I do not say you will be as intense as she is. I wish you were. She can go into some material thing which doesn't interest me at all, like money, and come out and make a fortune, as she has made a fortune. And she was as poor as a church mouse when she first heard me. She had never heard such strange, peculiar, unreasonable statements as she heard from me. And her first contact with me was to ask that question, what should I do? Should I go to Paris? It isn't rational. And I told her, I am not speaking of anything rational in this world. I am speaking of a power that isn't rational. The rational mind is simply the interference between the being that you are and this so-called world that you think so real. No, the rational mind, let it be what it wants to be. <clears throat> but I am not talking about that. I am speaking of something entirely different, and the world calls this being of whom I speak, Jesus Christ. But they do not know Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is a being. It's not some peculiar, as some friend of mine wrote the other day, it is not an essence. Imagination is not a vague essence. As she said, imagination is a being, a majestic being. A being of infinite love, but a being. Well, now, you heard me tell the story of my dear friend, Melo, the little girl, just eight or nine years old. Well, I got another letter from her. And the other letter, <clears throat> she said, I went to your lecture. And do you know? At the end of your lecture, you say, this little girl is Peter. And when I die, she will see the same king that she saw when I took her to France. And do you know what? At the end of your lecture, you took off your coat. <laughs> but I didn't see you take off the coat. I saw you take off your skin. You took off your skin, and I could see right through you. And right behind you was the king that I saw in France. And do you know what? He was you. And next to the king was a tombstone. And on the tombstone was written the word Neville. And then he faded and everything faded, and then I woke. Wasn't that incredible? And she spells the word incredible, incredible, incredible. <clears throat> Reminds me of my little girl when she was four, and someone said, what does your father do? And she said, he is a lecturer. <laughs> And I have never heard the word lecturer, but what I think of Vicky and her word, a lecturer. <laughs> and if someone gave us something, say, uh, for Christmas or something, and you couldn't find out what on earth is it? What is its purpose? And then mother would say, I wonder if it is functional. She couldn't pronounce the word functional, and she would say functional. Well, I have never heard the word functional since, but I think of functional. <clears throat> so if we get anything today that we can't quite understand what it is, which quite often at Christmas you get all kinds of things that you don't know. What on earth is it? What could you do with it? And so you put it in the gift drawer. Let someone else figure it out when you give it to them a year later. <clears throat> and here it is, and I think of functional. It isn't functional. Well, now, she said... Incredible. Isn't that precious? I have all her little letters now. But she saw the king, and she saw the tombstone, and she saw where that coat, which was only a symbol of the physical garment that was taken off. And here's the garment taken off and buried in that tombstone, and on earth it was called Neville. But beyond she saw the king, Behold your king. 
And she said, and it was you. And then it faded. Wasn't that incredible? So I tell you, you are an infinite being, an immortal being. You didn't begin in your mother's womb and you do not end in the grave. You are forever and forever and forever. And you are that king. You will awaken one day and you will not be any less than the being spoken of in scripture as Jesus Christ. There is only Jesus Christ in the world. There is only God in the world. And you and I will be one. One body, one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all. <clears throat> Let no one tell you because he precedes you in the awakening that he ranks ahead of you. No one ranks ahead even though you precede the one in the order of awakening. For there's only one being who is awakening. And that one being is God. And God is your own wonderful human imagination. <clears throat> if you could only be as intense as Louise towards physical things, you could in the immediate future get anything you want in this world. I personally have no desire for such things, none. But she has, and all well and good, she has it, let her have it, to the extreme. She came in, she insisted four years ago on giving me a certain picture because I, just to compliment her, passed an opinion about this painting that she had made, a copy of one, a great picture wasn't a great picture. The original was. And she offered it to me, and I said, no, I will not take it. I'm going to California. I'm certainly not going to take that frame that big and take it back to California. Do you know a friend of mine? He's here tonight. He went on a business trip to New York, and she persuaded him <laughs> to bring it, and he brought it to me. I, held, I hung it for about two years, and I couldn't stand it any longer. So I took it and buried it in the little closet. And she came and said, where is the picture? <clears throat> I said, well, I had it up for two years. And then I got a little bit dis uh, disturbed. I want to change the room. And so it was, where is it? I said, well, here it is. Luckily, I hadn't given it away. And so she said, I'll take it. All right, you take it. And she did. She took the picture. And she's going to take it right back to New York City again. That's the intensity of the woman. Money is an important thing with her. Everything she makes important. But when it came to this, the loss of her son, and she went into shock, she didn't find comfort in religion. She couldn't find comfort in books. She couldn't find comfort in anything. Everything went through the window. But she was determined to prove that her Larry survived. And all she could hang on to is that all things exist in the human imagination. And if that is true, well, then he's going to come out of me, and I will know he does exist, that he has survived that cremation. For she came back with the ashes and went to Central Park and scattered the ashes around the tree. <clears throat> and here comes Larry, sitting on the side of a chair, and she puts herself into the chair, and puts Neville on the other side of the chair. And here she is, carrying on. But I'll tell you how intense the woman is. When I say to her, on the 10th of November, if you have a son, his name is Neville Mark. She was determined she is not going to have a son. <clears throat> going to have a daughter. I said, all right, if it's a boy, his name is Neville Mark. But I haven't seen Neville in four years. Last time I saw him, he came down and spent three weeks with us, with us in Barbados. And he was a handsome, handsome lad. Long hair down below his shoulder. But unusually pretty. She tells me now he's about six feet. Even more stunning. He's just had his 18th birthday. He does all the cooking for them. Now, they don't need any uh, help. 
because they have all the money in the world. He does all the cooking. He does all the washing, all the ironing, all the sewing. He does everything. So she got her wish. She got a girl. And I got my son. <clears throat> he was a son. He makes the dresses. Of course, his father's a couturier. He's going to inherit that fabulous thing. The father's 77. So, in the not distant future, he will inherit this enormous thing. But he loves sewing. And he loves ironing the clothes. He likes all these things. He's now going to school to study designing and making of clothes and all these things. And so, with his long hair and that lovely, lovely skin of his, and undoubtedly, she does have her daughter. And I have in him my son. So, see, we both got it. And she said to me, do you remember anything in the past concerning Neville? Because you saw him before I did. I said, I can only tell you that he came to me, this handsome, handsome lad, about five years old. And he told me that I was his father. Well, you know, Louise, I have never known you physically. Therefore, physically, I am certainly not his father. But throughout infinity, these cross currents, who knows the relationship in all these things through eternity? He called me his father. At the moment, I wondered, well, when are you going to come? Because I knew this was a vision. And I knew he was not my son in this world. I knew my little girl, Vicky, when she came to me at the age of four or five. And she too called me daddy. And I said, if you, you are my daughter, if I'm your daddy, then what is your name? And she said, Victoria. And Simpson danced away. So when she was born, I called her Victoria. She has no middle name. She didn't give me a middle name. She said, my name is Victoria, so I call her Victoria. Now she's known to all as Vicky, but she has no middle name. I saw so vividly when she appeared to me, when she was about, my wife was then about five months pregnant. And I said to her, we're going to have a little girl, and her name is Victoria. Well, she came into the world, and she looked just unlike the little girl I saw. But at four, she grew into that child. Because when she was born, she looked just like Gandhi. Not a hair on her head, bad ears, just, just like a little offspring of Gandhi. At the age of four, a mass of curls. She was the image of the child I saw when she appeared to me in vision, say, about four or five years of age. And this lad, when he was four or five, was just like it. This handsome, beautiful lad. And today, they say he's just... Well, a raving beauty, six feet tall, 18 years old, with his long hair, and he makes his dresses, does all the ironing, he sews, he does everything. And so Louise, at determination, it didn't come in in a physical form as a daughter, but it came in in spirit as a daughter. And I came in, and my vision was true, it came in as a boy, as I saw him, and he told me his name was Neville Mark. And so he is named Neville Mark. Goes by the name of Neville. So I am telling you of the power within you. And that power is your own wonderful human imagination. And that is the only God in the world. There is no other God. That is the Jesus Christ of Scripture. So tonight, take it seriously. If you really have an objective in this world and you're waiting for something to happen on the outside to make it so, forget it. Do it in your own wonderful human imagination. Actually bring it into being in your own imagination. Conjure a scene which would imply the fulfillment of that dream and lose yourself in the act as you contemplate it. And completely lose yourself in that state. If you're completely absorbed in it, you would objectify it and you would see it seemingly independent of your perception of it. But even if you do not have that intensity, if you lose yourself in it and feel it to be true, the imaginal act, then drop it. In a way you do not know, it will become true. It will objectify itself on the screen of space 
And what the world calls reality, which is really only a shadow realm, as she so clearly described it. Here was her husband reading the morning paper, and he was a shadow talking. She goes out the street, the shop, and everyone she passes is a shadow talking. All talking shadows. And it lasted for 24 hours. And then the whole thing returned to what the world calls a normal world. But in that interval, at that very moment, she was cured. And the pain left her, the sense of loss left her, and not once since that moment has it ever returned. No sense of loss, no pain, and she's now the same powerful woman she was prior to that horrible accident that took him out of her life. It took him, and she discovered the truth that she had been applying towards things. And now she knows it is true in the deepest sense of the word, that all things exist in the human imagination. And that all that you behold, though it appears without, it is within. In your own wonderful human imagination, of which this world of mortality is but a shadow. And all this objective reality is solely produced through imagining. I don't care what it is. This room here, it first was imagined. The clothes you're wearing. Well, that was all imagined. Imagining preceded the thing that you now call real in the world. But man does not know it, and his memory is so short, he forgets the imaginal act, and then the harvest, which one day he will reap. And when he's confronted with the harvest, he can't relate it to anything he ever did that could produce it, and yet everything that comes into his world, he did it, but he doesn't remember. His memory is faulty. One day he will awaken. And when he awakens, he is the King of Kings. He is the Lord of Lords. He is the Lord Jesus Christ. He is Jehovah. And here is this little girl, Melo. And her mother said to her, when I told the story that she is Peter, <clears throat> And again, she went home and she told. And the little child, quite innocently and matter-of-factly, accepted it quite normally and then said to her mother, it's an errand. I came to do an errand. I came to see God. That's the purpose of her being in the world, just to see God. It is an errand. I came to do an errand. I came to see God. Now, here is a little girl, nine years old now. She is completely qualified now for apostleship. For that's the indispensable prerequisite that Paul lays down for being an apostle. And he asked the question in the ninth chapter of 1 Corinthians. He said, am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus, our Lord? He confessed he didn't see him after the flesh. But he saw him in spirit. And he insisted the one indispensable qualification for apostleship is to have seen the risen Lord. And so she has seen the risen Lord. She's qualified for apostleship. I will one day take that lovely child and embrace her, and she and I will fuse, and we will become one body, one spirit, one Lord, one God and Father of all, and then I will send her as I was sent, and send her into the world only to tell the eternal story. That's all that you're sent to do. You aren't saying to tell anything else, just the eternal story. This is a story that is taking place forever and forever. It's a command to be done absolutely and continuously, without reference to duration, without reference to position in time. It's a command 
to be done not only once, but that once is continuously done. Thy will must be being done. It's the imperative passive mood. That's how it's written. And here is a play written in the imperative passive mood to be done absolutely and continuously without reference to any position in time, without reference to duration. And so she too will be sent. And that I do know. And she will simply tell her own experiences as she awakens as the same being because you awaken only as the Lord Jesus Christ. She saw the tomb. The tomb was when the coat was taken off. And the coat she saw was my skin. And that's where the coat is buried. Let them fight over the coat. Let them cast lots for it. Let them take all these things and say this is where he's buried. And she sees him not buried, but the risen king. And she says, I could see right through your new skin. And behind that new skin, I saw the king. And the king was you. The same king that I saw when you took me to France. And then he faded. Wasn't that incredible? And then she signs. She hasn't yet reached the point where she can say love to me. That's too familiar. So she says, yours truly. <laughs> Melo McCaslin. That's too intimate. She keeps that love for her mother and her father and those nearer at the moment. But I assure her mother and grandmother here tonight, I am still more intimate. She is my Peter. She said that that I am your Peter, in her letter. And uh, these little words, like which, she leaves out the H, it's like a witch. <laughs> and this darling letter is such a precious thing. Well, I have it, and I'll keep it. <laughs> Someday someone will find it among my letters, because it's there to be preserved. But may I tell you, your own wonderful human imagination is the one spoken of in Scripture, as Jehovah, as the Lord God, as Jesus Christ. That is the only reality in the world. And one day, maybe a blow like the loss of a dear one, as it did in Louise's case, may be necessary to prove beyond all doubt all things do exist in the human imagination. And here he came in for a purpose, and he went out for a purpose. I didn't want to hurt you, mother. And that sudden departure, after she had plotted and planned, leave him millions, leave him a fortune. And everything was all plotted, plotted around that lad. And then like this, she gets a wire. And she told me at 6.15, she jumped out of her skin that morning, it was Saturday morning. And usually the children sleep late. That is, he did before he went off to college in London. And by habit, her husband Joseph gets up early. So he got up the usual time. But she would take a little extra nap. And suddenly she felt herself jumping. And she jumped up. I wonder what has happened. And I looked at the clock. It was 6.15. I wonder what has happened. Why did I do this? And then came Neville, Neville came in, and he always sleeps late on Saturdays and Sundays. And then came the call, and she asked the headmaster, when was he killed? And he said, 11.15. That's exactly 6.15 New York time. There's a difference of five hours between New York and London. New York is on the 75th, Meridian and London is Greenwich. And every 15 degrees, you have a change of an hour. Exactly to the minute. That's when he was killed. 11.15 London time, 6.15 New York time. And she woke with a jolt and wondered what on earth has happened. And when she heard London calling, she thought it was Larry. And when she heard this voice, and it was not Larry's voice, she asked automatically, what has happened to Larry? 
And then he said, I'm sorry to tell you, Mrs. Burley, but Larry is dead. And that's the story. And you wonder what happened when everything seemingly to live for, he brought to her this intense story <clears throat> that everything is within her. Now start using it lovingly because in you anyway, and do not use it unlovingly. You can have anything in this world that you want, but do it with the same intensity, but do it lovingly. <clears throat> for God is not only your own wonderful human imagination. God is infinite love. And your imagination is not some vague essence. It is a being, a majestic being that can be seen. And when you see, you will see the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And one day you too will take off the coat. And others will not see it, but anyone with incurrent eyes will see it. And they will see that you took off your body. You took off the skin. And through that transparent body, which you now wear, is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. <clears throat>